Ignorance is a very particular kind of delusion. Delusion in general is simply having wrong ideas about things, thinking that what's right is wrong or what's wrong is right. That can be very general. The ignorance that the Buddha is talking about as a cause of suffering is a very particular kind of delusion in that it's focused on the issues of suffering. Not knowing suffering, not knowing its cause, not knowing the cessation, and not knowing the path to its cessation. Then we might say, well, I've learned those things, I've heard them, so I know them. Well, there are levels of knowing. There's a knowing that comes from hearing, and there's a knowing that comes from thinking things through, and then there's a knowing that comes from actually putting things into practice. And it's that last one that really puts an end to ignorance. Because it's a special kind of knowing. You see things happening in the mind. And you understand what can be done with them. And you do it. So we talk about applying the Four Noble Truths to our experience. It's not that we go around with the terms in our mind. It actually starts out with a series of questions. I call them the Four Noble Questions. You know, what is suffering here, right in this experience right now? What's causing it? What would its cessation be, and what's the path to that cessation? You may not even think in specifically those terms. What's wrong here? What can I do about it? And you figure out what can I do about it? Well, you have to first look at the cause. Years back when I was teaching English at Chiang Mai University, back when I was a layperson, I taught a composition class to a group of social science majors. We talked about problem-solving compositions, where you focus on a problem and figure out the cause, and then propose an end to this problem by attacking the cause. We started out with advertisements. Are you unattractive? Nobody likes you? Well, maybe it's you're wearing the wrong clothes and that kind of thing. And then we moved up to social problems. But as I kept saying to them all along, this is based on the Four Noble Truths. This is nothing particularly Western. It's very Buddhist. What makes the Four Noble Truths special as a problem-solving approach is one, it focuses on a particular problem and then identifies what that problem is. I.e., focuses on suffering as the big problem in life, which means not only the Buddha is telling us some interesting facts about suffering, but he's also saying this is the big problem in life. And many of us will agree, but then he goes on to analyze in ways that many of us might not agree with right off the bat. It's only when we get to put his approach into practice that we begin to see how right it is. That this is the big problem. We have so many other agendas that we think are more important in terms of our relationships, our jobs, our plans for our lives, basically our set of values. And these can get in the way of seeing that suffering is the big problem. This is a value judgment on the Buddhist part. This is the problem to focus on, and it's the suffering you're causing yourself. That's the big problem. We can focus on all the problems that are being created out there in the world. But we suffer from them simply because we approach them in the wrong way. We don't have to suffer from those things. So the issue is right here with our awareness, right here with our mind. And so it moves from just a general problem-solving approach to a problem-solving approach focused on suffering, and then it gets more specific about what the suffering is. And makes some unexpected moves. As the Buddha said, the suffering, he gives a long list of different kinds of things that we all are familiar with in terms of the pain that they cause. Then he says the common thread is the five clinging aggregates, which is not all that immediately apparent, but we take his guideline here. So when you ask yourself, you know, what's the suffering right now? Where's the stress? That's what he has you look for, so you're not just casting around and having to reinvent the Dharma wheel every time you ask the, que ask the question. How are you going to see these aggregates? Well, that's when you develop the path. That's why we're doing concentration here. 
practicing mindfulness concentration so that we can be steadily here in the present moment, so we can watch things. Because the Buddha's word for the cause of suffering is interesting. It's not the usual word for cause in Pali, hetu. It's samudhya, which means something that arises at the same time. That's what we're looking for. Wherever there's a disturbance in the mind, you want to look at what happened at the same time. And when that disturbance passes away, well, okay, what passed away at the same time? The two are connected. So to see that, you have to be here very steadily, to see ups and downs. Otherwise, it's like walking into a room, there's a show on the TV, and you come in for a few minutes and you leave. Then half an hour later, you come back. The characters are different. Well, what were the ups and downs in the meantime? You didn't see. So you don't know. But if you stay there, you can watch the show and you begin to see, oh, this is why this character is upset now, because that character said something. And it's the same with the mind. If you want to see the events of the mind, how they contribute to added stress, you have to have a firm baseline, getting the mind as still as possible, because a lot of these things are subtle. And then just stay there, alert at the same time that you are questioning, okay, what's going to happen? When is the stress going to rise? Some of the forest giants compare this to being a hunter. The hunter has to be very still. The hunter goes to the spot in the forest where he knows where the animals that he wants tend to be. But he sits there very still, but at the same time very alert. And that's that proper balance between stillness and alertness that allows you to see these things in the mind. And the more stillness there is, the more subtle things you're going to be able to see. So in this case, doing the concentration is, again, applying the Four Noble Truths. You realize concentration is something good to do. It should be done. It, it is to be developed. So just that right there, you're getting into those Four Noble Questions. When the mind settles down. What do you do with it? You try to develop that quality of being settled down. And then you watch. It's like being a spider in a web. A spider call is another kind of hunter. In this case, the spider has to be very attuned to the web. Any slight vibration in the web that it recognizes as a likely suspect, they'll go search it out. If it sees it, it's got what it wants on the web, it spins a little something around it, and then it goes back. Now in this case, what you want to do, you want to get the mind really still and then watch. Be sensitive to any changes that occur in the body or the mind. Anybody to see that there's a kind of a stirring that happens in the area that's hard to identify either as being physical or metal. It's kind of at the, the meeting place between the two. There'll be a stirring. And the mind has the choice of how it's going to identify that as something physical or as something metal. And so you take advantage of that choice and saying, I'm going to identify that as physical right now. I'm going to breathe through it. That way you nip a lot of thoughts in the body, because otherwise if you identify it as a mental event, then it becomes a thought. A thought about what? Well, it could be about tomorrow's meal. It could be about where you're going next week. It could be about the events of the past few days. All kinds of things. It's your choice. But as you're here not to develop those things, you're here to develop concentration. You want to zap those. This is where those Four Noble Questions are really useful, because it's a duty that goes with each. Our problem is we get the duties mixed up. We tend to develop our craving and we tend to abandon the path. And that doesn't help anything much of all. There's a story about Chokun Na. He was a famous meditating monk in Bangkok. He was doing walking meditation outside his hut one night. And this young monk came up and 
asked for some help. He was just being pestered by certain thoughts that he just couldn't let go. They kept his mind kept going to those thoughts again and again. They really had him worried. Jokunno looked at him and says, well, "You're doing the wrong duty." And went into his hut. Fortunately, the monk had read about the Four Noble Truths and their duties. He realized that he was developing the cause of suffering and abandoning the path. Switch it around him. Try to develop the path, this stillness of mind. Keep with it. And the question comes up, what do I do when I'm bored? We let the boredom go. You don't identify with the boredom. You don't develop the boredom, which is what we're really good at. You try to develop the path instead. You realize that the boredom is not there as your friend. And John Sawa used to like to say that we tend to see suffering as our enemy and craving as a friend. We've got the roles backwards. Craving is the enemy. And suffering, if we really get to know it well, will teach us a lot of things. So we have to be on good terms with it. Not that we're planning to settle down and live with it forever, but we. We're not going to be able to get past it until we know it really well. So see it as an opportunity. And see the path as your opportunity for getting past it. Now sometimes there are certain sufferings we really identify with. There's some sufferings we feel have a, a moral value. Those are the ones that are really hard to let go. So over the grief of someone we've, we've lost. You feel that if you don't suffer over them, you're being disloyal. But the Buddha said that's not the case. You can still be loyal to that person and not suffer from the grief. You have to be able to make that distinction. This, is, again, is where it comes down to a question of values. We're asking those Four Noble Questions to arrive at the Four Noble Truths. In other words, there are answers to the questions. But sometimes the answers are not what you'd expect to begin with, and there's going to be a part of the mind that's going to resist. This is where you have to have faith in the Buddha. He really knew what he was talking about. And it's a faith that's really confirmed only with stream entry. You begin to get some hints of its truth at the point where you really do arrive at the right answers. Those four noble questions. What is the suffering right now? What is the cause? What is the path? You start with the general framework and you move in. But remember, it's not just the framework, it's also the set of values that this is the big problem. And if the mind resists that, okay, then dig that resistance up and look at it. And decide whether you want to side with it or you want to side with the Buddha's questions. It's when you think in these terms that you start developing your concentration into right concentration. As the Buddha defines it, it's concentration that's endowed with all the other factors of the path. It may sound like a lot of busyness, like a mother chick who's got to have this chick here and this chick here, and whoop, that chick has run out and you've got to go and catch that, and whoops, the other chicks have gone. I know what happens is that you get the mind really still and you've got the right questions and everything else falls into place. Just as long as you have that trust in the Buddha that these really are the right questions to ask. And then test yourself, do they lead to a noble attainment? That's what makes the questions noble, that's what makes the truths noble. Because it'll lead the mind to a state that's noble. On a very high dimension. <laughs>